Good morning. Good morning, folks. Hey, everybody. So lots of people streaming in. We'll give it one more minute. You know, Mark, I see you more on than I see my wife these days. <laughs> <laughs> I know, isn't it great? Um, yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> All right. So I think we're getting most of the folks who are in the waiting room in at this point. So let's go ahead and get started. Tracy, does that sound good to you? All right, welcome everybody. Oh, go back one if you would. Welcome everyone, I'm Amy Wittenberg. I'm the Executive Director of Third Place Commons and I'm really happy to welcome you um, to this wonderful, uh, ex exciting event. I'm so, so um, thrilled that we can be the host to this wonderful event and um, grateful to the amazing team who's brought this event to us today. Um, and I just wanna say that we are gonna continue this conversation. We have an event um, planned tentatively for May 26th on climate change, the ethics of climate change. And we hope you'll join us for that. We're gonna have one of our presenters, um, Natalie Hopkins back later in the summer and we have some other things going on. So we wanna continue this conversation. We hope you'll join us for future programs as well. Keep an eye on our um, social media and calendar for those events. And now, I, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our MC for the day, Tracy Fioritani. Hi, well, thank you, Amy, very much. And I thank uh, Third Place Commons for hosting this event. Um, we have this huge audience, as you can see, and I thank you all for attending this uh, first Lake Forest Park Community Town Hall on Climate Resilience. My name is Tracy Furutani, and uh, my day job is teaching sciences at North Seattle College. I've been a resident in Lake Forest Park for uh, 17 years, which makes me something of a newcomer. And uh, we welcome all newcomers and lifelong residents as well as non-residents to this town hall. Uh, today's topic is building climate resiliency, listen, ask, and learn. And I hope you take that to heart. Uh, there's going to be a lot of presenters who'll say um, there are no stupid questions, and I want you to be assured that that's absolutely true. After our plenary speakers, which I'll introduce in a minute, uh, we'll, we've got a couple of breakout sessions, a panel of wise young voices after the uh, lunch break, and a community conversation to round out the day, all of which I strongly encourage you to ask questions about things you're uncertain about, things you want to know, uh, things you may have heard. Um, we hope that you'll get out of this day is an appreciation for many of these uh, uh, fronts on which we're working on this problem of climate crisis and uh, what your part in that might be. So um, if this basically for, especially for those of you non-residents gives you an idea of what you might wanna do in your neighborhood or in your own city, uh, that, that's all to the good. You'll see a lot of things we probably will do wrong. We want you to do it better. So, and of course uh, we invite comments after the uh, event so you can um, leave you know, messages about how we could improve. Okay, so before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that here in LFP, Lake Forest Park, we are on occupied territory of all Coast Salish people who have stewarded this land for generations. Uh, in particular, the, du the Duwamish, the first people of Seattle and much of King County who are still here and continue to embody and practice the strengths of their indigenous cultural teachings and values, who have reserved the treaty rights to this land, past and present. We need to protect and honor the history of people of this Duwamish land and our indigenous neighbors, the Su 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 Squa sorry, Squamish, the Squally, uh, Snoqualmie, and Muckleshoot tribes for their enduring care and protection of our shared lands and waterways. So uh, behind me right here is a visual reminder of what the climate crisis is about. This is a address lent to me by my uh, climate justice, a justice activist friend and fellow chemistry colleague at North Seattle College, Heather Price. She designed this dress with each row of the dress representing the year from 1850 at the shoulders to 2019 down at the hem. Okay, And uh, the color of each row represents whether that particular year was colder than normal mm. or warmer than normal. And uh, the uh, and normal is defined as essentially this stretch right here from 1970 to 2000, um, and so you can see clearly the trend that's been happening over the past few decades. So uh, you know that's what we really want to talk about today is basically what we can do about that. All right. <clears throat> 
So I want to present first, uh, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce the mayor of Lake Forest Park, Jeff Johnson. He's been serving as mayor since 2015 and is a lifelong resident of the city. Uh, one of his visions is that he would be able, he, uh, and I love this, is that he would be able to take his grandson fishing in the streams of Lake Forest Park someday. And we hope that he has achieved his vision. So Mayor Johnson, if you'd like to say a few words. You betcha. Thanks, Tracy. Hello, I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of the city of Lake Forest Park to this town hall on this critical topic. Several years ago, Lake Forest Park joined the King County City's climate collaboration, K4C, the county organization which is working to reduce carbon emissions and reverse global warming. As one of K4C's cities, we have all adopted the goal of reducing carbon emissions by 50% by 2030 and 90% by 2050. There's a lot of work to be done. We have one great advantage as we move forward. We have preserved and enhanced our tree canopy. We have an enviable urban forest. So that together myself, the city council and the staff all wanna partner with you to move this city forward and being stewards of our great, beautiful city and the world. As I listened to our council last night, I can guarantee you this subject was front and center on their minds. With that, I would like to ask you, while you discuss what ideas and changes we need, you also think in ways to assist the city in the means to carry out our goals. We all will, we're all in this together, so we need your help and we are here to help you. Just on a little side note, because most of you know I own an auto repair shop and a gas station, and uh, I turned 60 this year, and believe it or not, the guy who owns the gas station auto repair shop is looking at a hybrid truck. So, you know, <laughs> even, even I can change. So it's all good stuff. So with that, thanks, folks, who organized this. It's been a lot of work. It's been going on. Thank you to all the citizens and who are here. Um, thanks, I'm sure, a lot of my council sitting there. And with that, let's move on and listen, ask, and learn. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mayor Johnson. Appreciate your comments, and uh, uh, um, I'm, you know, really looking forward to basically uh, you and the City Council getting feedback from our group here about the direction we'd like to take our city to. Um, so, uh, one, I've just been reminded, um, right, uh, that if you want to basically center the speaker on screen, um, up in your view box in the Zoom window, uh, there's basically a thing called speaker view, if you're not aware of, and what that'll do is center the speaker on the uh, on the screen and make them big. And that way you can actually uh, um, kind of get, you know, see details like in my dress, for instance, and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, so we begin today's program with a couple of plenary speakers, uh, both who are experts in their fields. Um, the first speaker is Vicki Stiles. She's the executive director of the Praise Sorry. You. I don't know if you heard any of that. Okay, I apologize. Um, did you guys all hear about that speaker view thing I talked about? Okay, perfect. Yeah, all we right. heard that part. Yeah, for some reason I got muted. Sorry, I do apologize. All right. Um, we begin today's program with a couple of plenary speakers, both experts in their field. Uh, the first speaker is Vicki Stiles, the executive director of the Shoreline Historical Museum. She's been that for many years. And uh, the title of her talk is Historical Environmental Change in Lake Forest Park. So Vicki. Thank you very much, Tracy. And uh, I hope that uh, today in 25 minutes or less, <laughs> I can share with you a roadmap to the future because that's what history is. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the museum first. If only it will come, there we go. And then I will uh, tell you about the six things that have really affected um, our environment and habitat in the Lake Forest Park and Northwest King County area. So the museum has been around since 1975 and we're located in Shoreline at 18501 Linden Avenue. And uh, happy to share any of this information with you later if you want more uh, detailed resources. The first thing I'd like to talk about um, 
is well, environment, habitat, and climate all go hand in hand. And you'll see that in Lake Forest Park, besides glaciation of thousands of years ago, there have been what in my mind I call the big six factors that have affected habitat and environment. First of all, the people themselves have been here for thousands of years. David Berge, the author of Chief Seattle and the Town That Took His Name, uh, who is an authority on the Native American occupation of this area, estimates that the Duwamish and their relatives have been in this area for about 650 generations or in the neighborhood of 12,000 to 13,000 years. It's well known that this area was the host of a permanent winter village belonging to the Tuobadabsh, a Duwamish group who also had a village at Matthews Beach. And on this map, you can see uh, Lake Forest Park, if you're able to follow my cursor, um, where there was uh, a village and also Matthews Beach here. And you'll see a system of trails, not like we know the Burt Gilman Trail today, but ways of getting from place to place to important places. Um, here, the people worked with their resources and, and were stewards of the land. Um, through various methods of conservation, habitat manipulation, and their own rules, Native Americans led a well-sustained life here. Controlled burns as seen around Echo Lake, near Matthews Beach, and along what we call today Greenwood, created meadowlands and attracted small and large game and encouraged the growth of edible and usable sun-loving plants. There were many other conservation practices as well, such as the use of seasonal fishing weirs that allowed certain fish to always get through and the carefully specific collection of materials, for instance, uh, a way of collecting cedar bark and roots so as not to kill the trees. I won't have time today to address the marshalling of Native Americans out of their homes by the US government and um, demanding non-Native settlers and the subsequent treaties that were loosely followed by the government, in some cases not at all. But um, suffice to say, here we have uh, the low bush cranberry. Uh, a lot of the stewarded areas uh, that were so carefully conserved by Native Americans are no longer with us. Cranberry bogs were huge in this area. Uh, there was one in Lake Forest Park and a really big one at Ronald Bog, and those were ruined by changes in drainage systems and construction and peat mining. Between 1855 and 1859, the Carleton survey team of USGS surveyors uh, tramped through this area and created a survey for the government. And at the same time, a military road was also being established from Vancouver to Bellingham through this area. Uh, and though it wasn't uh, a really huge road through our area, it was a little, much more like a cow path. But in 1862, the land was put up for sale by the government and it went primarily to logging interests and land speculators for $1.25 an acre. And all of the people you see on this map are the uh, original non-native certificate holders. And Puget Mill particularly um, was very evident in this area and they took almost all of the shoreline uh, of along Lake Washington and then other uh, landholders, Marshall Blinn, Joseph Williamson, Campbell, <clears throat> these were all big timber magnates who sometimes just leased out their rights to small logging operations. In the case of Lake Forest Park, it's interesting, some logging was done between uh, 1885 and 1892, but very little because it all had to be done by hand. And really our number two on our list of um, changes to this environment and habitat is the building of the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern Railroad, which happened between 1885 and 1887. Though um, 
a small amount, as I said, of logging had been done along Lion Creek. The first really big destruction of uh, the coastline of the lake was done by the rail. We often don't think about what it's like to build a railroad, but um, if you've never observed a thing like that, in fact, actually, we're kind of seeing it right now with the light rail. So um, you can keep that in mind when you think about how, what it would have been like to build this railroad along the coast of Lake Washington. So a lot of equipment has to be brought in, land has to be cleared, there has to be places for materials to be stored, and there has to be places for the construction crew to live, eat, sleep, perform bodily functions. Um, all of this activity would have wreaked havoc on the streams emptying into the lake and disrupted the fisheries as well as wildlife depending on those resources. The construction of the railroad forever altered the habitat along the lakeshore. And 20 years later, we can look at pictures of the lakeshore and still see a very disorganized and uh, disarrayed shoreline that resulted from that project. Well, since hand logging was so difficult, um, what really changed uh, all of Lake Forest Park forever was uh, number three on my list, and that was the bringing in of the logging train by the French and Fish Logging Company around 1900. Uh, again, this required heavy equipment and establishing cramp, uh, camps that created um, habitat destruction. But uh, the taking of nearly every single tree, because it was relatively easier than hand logging, just changed the environment completely and changed the microclimates of streams and, um, and part of the lake. So I'm going to show you some pictures. Now, this is the French and fish logging, uh, dumping their logs off into the lake. Everything was logged from Lake Washington up to Lake Ballinger. And if you look at this picture, these pictures, you can see there's not a tree standing. Um, the, the area was completely changed forever because of this logging. And uh, you can believe me when I say there's no old growth uh, left, maybe in a gully or two where they couldn't get to the trees. And it happened all the way around the lake. If you look across in the background of this photo, you'll see the moorlands um, that's part of Kenmore. You see a spindly tree or two standing, but this was a moonscape. Well, when Ole Hansen chose to purchase this logged off property that he would call Lake Forest Park, he was not seeing the original forest. He was seeing meager second growth and an enormous swath of cleared land that would not need much more clearing before he could sell it to people who wanted roads and cleared lots. His sales pitch, however, was really um, <laughs> interesting. He was asking people to envision what could be, I think. But uh, of course, number four on my list is the not only clearing, but the subsequent sale of the property to the North Seattle Improvement Company, Ole Hansen's real estate arm. So as people wanting to get out of town uh, began to trickle into Lake Forest Park, uh, here we see um, the results of Aishel Curtis's uh, efforts to create uh, a rather um, false picture of what Lake Forest Park was. They photographed only places where there were trees. It was advertised in 1910, uh, and they made sure to show the beauty that was left behind from the logging and completely avoided photographing any clear-cut areas. But when people got to Lake Forest Park, and here we see the survey team hired by um, Ole Hansen. This is what they saw. A few spindly trees, some uh, 
deciduous trees that had taken the place of the logged off trees uh, because logging had occurred in uh, 1900 and along the lake shore probably a little earlier than that. And um, but here we have the moonscape of the Lake Forest Park School in 1913 that really never changed. The completion of the road, of course, uh, con road construction was very important and also uh, further um, changed the habitat at the mouths of the streams uh, along in dumping into um, Lake Washington. Here is a, an introduction to number four on my list. The person taking this photo was seen standing at the end of the pier that we just saw previously. This is right before what another really devastating change happened in Lake Forest Park. Sorry to keep using the word devastating, but um, you can see what a big, big difference these things made. Here we have the railroad right along the lake shore. And up here, you can just barely see a little truck coming along what would become Baja Way on the Gear Erickson Road. And of course, there were steamers that ran the lake. And um, up until 1916, you could go sightseeing up lakes, uh, up uh, the Sammamish River to Lake Sammamish. And that was a very popular trip. Well, something happened in 1916 to change all of that. Here in the foreground, we see Lake Union, and in the background, Lake Washington. And this is the portage between the two lakes. In 1916, the Hiram Chittenden Locks opened, and the dam between uh, Lake Washington and Lake Union was cut through and the water flowed unabated from Lake Washington, which was about 18 feet higher in elevation, the Lake Union, into Lake Union and Lake Washington lost about nine feet of water. That translated into somewhere between not too much and hundreds of feet of extra shoreline. It left uh, the stream outflows changed forever and completely eliminated the historic salmon runs as the salmon had always come home up the Black River. The Black River was the outlet to Lake Washington and the lake with the lowering of the lake, the lake became lower than its outlet and the Black River dried up. This eliminated the salmon run and also eliminated the last vestiges of traditional of a traditional way of life for the Duwamish people, most of whom were living along the Black River and the Duwamish River. It was a very sad event and something that was not even noted in the newspapers. Well, um, so the salmon that we see today are not from that original run. This shows the reconfiguration of Lake Washington shore. Snags had to be called out of the lake. It was uh, just an incredible um, view of, of what had happened. I wish that we had more photographs of it. And here you see them people enjoying the muck of what was left <laughs> after the lake was lowered. And you can see the piers. This is the pier at Lake Forest Park that we saw earlier. It's no longer in the water. So people with piers weren't very happy, I'm sure. But Pope and Talbot, the real estate arm of Puget Mill, was very happy because they owned um, a lot of that extra shoreline. And here again, you can see, oh, sorry. One. You can see the moonscape of uh, Kenmore back here. And here's the pier, no longer in the water. And so people began to buy the shoreline and 
Um, here's the Johansson family enjoying the muck. I've heard from people that I knew who were there at that time that it smelled pretty bad. Well, number five on my list is the building of more homes and roads, especially along the shoreline. More land was lost to development and wildlife was more and more reduced to living in pockets of habitat. And uh, the connections between those pockets became very tenuous. So large animals such as bear and cougar began to become more scarce. And um, of course, because of the proximity of people. Here we see Sheridan Beach in 1927. And here I want to show you the original shoreline. And now when you walk on the Brook Gilman Trail, you think, oh, it's so far away from the lake. Remember, that trail was the railroad line and ran right along the shore. And here is what happened after the lake was lowered. Well, number six on my list is the resultant pop pollution of Lake Washington and its streams by all of this development. Septic tanks and outhouses leached into the ground unabated. Homes along the lake sometimes just let their sewage flow freely into it. And uh, no one was really paying attention to the abundance of fecal coliform bacteria and just plain old raw sewage in the lake until about 1925 when the pollution became so bad, there began to be a, a hue and a cry about it in the newspapers. And you're gonna see, of course, building of roads, new piers and everything. These were all very disruptive. Uh, development uh, after World War II, here we see the Navy Hospital that is really uh, near the Lake Forest Park Third Edition. Um, they had their own sewage treatment plant, but uh, nobody else did. There, there were just newspaper article after newspaper article about raw sewage flowing into the lake. And it was a very, very serious problem. Swimming in the lake was banned in most areas. Um, and when they, in 1943, when they analyzed the water, the state public health engineer said the lake was almost sewage. Some of us who are older remember what that was like. Swimming lessons at Juanita Beach were hazardous. Uh, finally, after many years of arguing from 1925 until 1952, at last some sewers were, sewer pipes were laid, but in Lake Forest Park, sewers came uh, quite a bit later and um, pollution was killing fish. In 1963, 63,585 fish died. 1962, 132,000 fish from pollution. And the newspaper even got them their own, uh, <laughs> their own reporting wrong. They said they'd been working on it and crying about it since 1929, actually 1925. So it took a really long time for this problem to be somewhat solved. Uh, a zoologist, Dr. Uh, Thomas Edmondson, worked with uh, officials and came up with a solution to reversing some of the damage that had been done by raw sewage. So <clears throat> in 1990, there was a problem with the Lake Washington Bridge sinking. And I think it's interesting that today we are still dealing with this particular problem. Well, hopefully we pay a lot more attention to that now and to how we treat our environment and the habitats around us. In our lifetimes, it's likely that we will still have our lakes and streams. And while we can't go back, we can work to maintain and preserve what we have. So thank you very much. I will end my talk.
All right. Thank you very much, Vicki. Um, it was really uh, informative. And, uh, you know, we always think of Lake Forest Park as this, uh, uh, you know, undispoiled natural preserve at the north end of the lake. But, you know, it is a second generation uh, anthropogenically modified uh, environment, isn't it? All right, and we're going to pick up on that theme now. Um, um, uh, one thing I want to remind everybody is we are recording this uh, uh, session for uh, future streaming uh, purposes. I, I'm not sure exactly which platforms we'll be on. We'll have that information at the end of the program. Okay, I'd like to introduce our other plenary speaker today. He's a biology instructor at North Seattle College and Shoreline College. Uh, Brian Saunders is a lifelong resident of Lake Forest Park and serves on the board of the Lake Forest Park Stewardship, a local nonprofit. He'll be taking, uh, talking about uh, climate change, past, present, and future. So, Brian. Well, thank you very much, Tracy. And can everybody hear me all right? I get my thing up. Oh, am I getting thumbs up? All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I thought uh, this conference, um, and by the way, uh, Tracy, a little correction, I am not an expert in climate change or a, a climatologist, much like Wally Brocker here, who was famously quoted in the 1970s, that the climate system is an angry beast, and we are poking it with sticks, and uh, that will become very evident, uh, hopefully, by the end of my talk. But I thought this conference really should have a sort of climate 101. I've been teaching environmental science for over 20 years, and it really is one of the most incredible things to see students sort of see these basic ideas of climate change and, and, and what we can do about it. And so I wanted to present what we know about climate change today. How does it compare to the past? And where does that leave us for the future? So we need to first always address the elephant in the corner of the room, which is what is causing our climate change. And by far and away, the, the greatest way we're causing climate change is the burning of fossil fuels, the emissions that we produce that get into our atmosphere and increase the greenhouse effect. And I often challenge my students at the very beginning of my, my classes to say, write me a more ridiculous, fictitious novel of an advanced society that can fly around the world in a day, can even explore space and has very sophisticated communication technology, and yet still powers the industry, their basic industri industry on the ancient remains of 200 million year old organisms. You only have to say this to realize how ridiculous this world we live in has, has become. And these, like this little diatom here, has basically got this floating about in the oceans, photosynthesizing, and about 200 million years uh, ago, it, it died and sank to the bottom, and along with a lot of other diatoms, got entombed and mineralized, and the hydrocarbons became oil, gas, and in some cases with plants, coal. And now we are releasing those carbon atoms. These 200 million year old carbon atoms are now being released back into our atmosphere to add to the carbon atoms that we already have. So you really have to understand that this is the problem. This is an unsustainable energy source and it's creating the problem of, the green, of increasing our greenhouse effect. So before I go any further, we really should have a, a clear understanding of the definition between these two terms because they often get mixed up. Weather, of course, is what's happening outside today. And climate is the long-term changes that we see over decades, hundreds to thousands to even millions of years. So it would be incorrect for me to think about our last week we had in Lake Forest Park and how unusually warm it was for April to be that warm and say, well, there you go, there's climate change. That's mixing up climate and weather. What's happening on a day-to-day -day basis can't really be tied to climate unless you look at it in a whole bunch of data over long periods of time. So the climate uh, that we've just been talking about, the climate change is mainly because we are warming our planet. We are warming our planet by burning fossil fuels and these emissions get into our atmosphere. So how do these emissions actually work? Well, this is a short little video, hopefully you can see it. Uh, but it shows us how the sunlight comes into our planet, but that's not what warms our planet actually. What, what warms our planet is the sun hits the surface of the earth and as heat starts to radiate away from the earth, it gets trapped by these greenhouse gases. And these greenhouse gases reflect them back down to our planet. 
So it really is a, an appropriate uh, term to say the greenhouse effect because it acts very much like a greenhouse where sunlight passes through the glass panels, it warms your bench, your potting bench and your cement floor. And as the heat tries to escape, the glass holds that heat into that building. So you can imagine that if we continue to add more and more greenhouse gases to our atmosphere, the more and more heat it will trap. And here are the fine players that uh, are involved. Uh, we think about methane, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and fluorinated gases. But you notice that most scientists fo focus mainly on carbon dioxide. And you can probably see why. There's two reasons why. The first is it's the most dominant greenhouse gas that we have in our atmosphere. And it also hangs around for long periods of time. And the second reason is, is because when we think about um, the carbon changes that occur, uh, where was I going with this? Uh, oh, uh, sorry, uh, I was thinking about something else, but now I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue on because I've, 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 oh, it's because of the biological aspects of the carbon dioxide. We know that not only is carbon dioxide involved in the physical aspects of our greenhouse effect, it's heavily involved in the biological processes on our planet. And if you haven't taken biology, a little biology 101 for you, photosynthesis, of course, is that amazing process that plants are doing, where plants suck up CO2 from the atmosphere. And with the help of sunlight and water, it converts that CO2 into a food molecule that the plant can then utilize for powering its body. We add, and during that process, by the way, by splitting water, it then releases oxygen. And animals take advantage of this. They can then eat the plant material to gain food, and we utilize the oxygen released during photosynthesis to burn that food molecule in our bodies. And when we burn that food molecule, it releases it back as CO2. So CO2 has an incredible hold, not just on the physical aspects of our planet, but on the biology of our planet, which really makes it a, an amazing molecule to, to, uh, to focus on. Now, to talk about CO2 and how much CO2 is in our atmosphere, I feel like we need to sort of talk about the story of CO2 and how we discovered it, how we learned about its, uh, its present day concentrations and how it has been in the past and what this also means to our future. We need to start in 1958. And in 1958 is really where the story of CO2 begins. So let me introduce you to a young scientist back then named Charles Keeling, who was a graduate from MIT. And where, as a graduate student, he developed a machine that could do something that no other scientist could do at the time, which was measure atmospheric CO2. So he wanted to learn how much CO2 was in our atmosphere and how much it changed over time. And so he chose a very appropriate site, a place uh, on the top of Mauna Loa volcano, uh, where he built or had the NOAA observatory where he put up his machine. And it's a great place to, to study CO2 because as you can see from this picture, there's no plant life or animal life around it that could then interfere with his carbon dioxide readings. And he could get precise measurements of what's going on in the atmosphere. Now, it should be mentioned at the time, most scientists thought CO2 was fairly erratic as a, a, a gas in our atmosphere. And so when he started to do his initial samples, he sure enough got some really kind of erratic readings. Initially, some of that CO2 would increase. Some of the other parts of the CO2 then started to decrease. As you can see, these little dots now coming to uh, form. He even had these little hiccups, uh, like all good projects. They have electrical failures, two of them, in fact, in the first year. But soon a pattern really started to emerge. And this pattern, by the way, when I was an undergraduate student, stopped me dead in my tracks. Because what he saw was sometimes during the year, CO2 levels would increase and peak. And then other times during the year, the CO2 levels would fall. And he quickly realized what this meant. This meant exactly at time with the seasons that's going on in our Northern hemisphere. So during the fall and winter months when vegetation lose leaves, they decompose, they release by respiration the CO2 into our atmosphere, we get the peaks. 
And then during the spring and summer months of the Northern Hemisphere, plants reawaken from their winter hibernation. They begin to photosynthesize and they suck up the CO2 from the atmosphere. So we have this yearly peaks and valley and he just thought that this was amazing. And this to me was just unbelievable to see as a graduate student or as a student, because I recognize it's basically the planet breathing. The planet is sucking in CO2 from, resp or from photosynthesis, breathing in and then breathing out. And when Keeling started to then analyze this year after year, he would get these same peaks and valleys, the decomposition of leaf during the winter months the photosynthetic capabilities during the spring and summer months. And it was just an incredible thing to witness. This is the first time we had witnessed this, in, this type of change that occurred on a seasonal basis. But as Charles Keeling kept on measuring year after year, a troubling trend started to form. And that troubling trend is that the CO2 levels still peaked and valleyed as we see, but the overall concentration of CO2 was increasing over time. He started measuring in 1958, and P PPM, by the way, is parts per million of carbon dioxide, and he started at about 318 parts per million, and by the time he died, by the way, in 2005, we had reached about 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. It's a, it's a, it's a moment that we really should pause because at this point in time, we have direct evidence that the burning of fossil fuels, which releases carbon dioxide, is being added to our atmosphere and it's increasing our CO2 levels. This is the first time that has ever been shown. Now, what happens if we continue on with our burning of fossil fuels as business as usual, as they say? Well, there are projections that we could double that 402, get up to a thousand perhaps parts per million. And even if we were to stop our production of CO2 as shown in this graph, we would still increase CO, uh, CO2 levels would still be high for a while because of the longevity of CO2 in our atmosphere. But at least we could avoid perhaps some major disasters. All right, so what does the CO2 levels mean as far as temperature goes? Well, when we look at the temperature, and this is, of course, done by many different scientists, thousands of scientists doing double checking and, and measuring temperatures from when we could way back in the pre-industrial ages or maybe in the mid of the industrial ages, 1850s to today, we see that kind of relationship that we all we have always known in the past is the relationship between CO2 and temperature. And we see that over the last uh, 200 years, the, the amount of temperature that has increased on average, again, this is the average temperature that's increased on our planet, is about 1.2 degrees Celsius. So what does that mean? Is that bad? What does the 410 parts per million today mean? To, I mean, in order to really understand what all this means, we need reference points. So that's why we have to look to the past, because the past gives us those reference points on what was the temperature like uh, back in the, in the days, and what was the world like back in those days? What was the CO2 levels like? By the way, we should note that our average temperature today, as you can see from this graph, is about 15, a little over 15 degrees Celsius on average. So that's taking the average again of the pol cold polar regions and the averages of the warm tropical regions, and you basically come up with about a 15 degrees Celsius average. And the, there's two things you should take away from this graph. And I know it's kind of a cartoon version, but it does kind of, it goes back to about a million years. You can see the average temperature on the left-hand margin here. And it shows us that climate has had peaks and valleys, huge peaks and valleys. But the, one of the first things that you should note is the, the changes that have occurred between those peaks and valleys hasn't occurred over hundreds of years. It's occurred over thousands to tens of thousands of years. We are changing the CO2 and the temperature changes more rapidly than it probably ever happened in our planet uh, history. The other thing that you should note is, for instance, the difference between a temperature of like 14 or 13 degrees Celsius and that of 9 degrees Celsius is the difference between an interwarming period and a ice age. So three or four degrees Celsius change is massive on this scale. 
And we've already changed the, the scale by a, a, a single degree in less than 200 years. All right, so what can we learn from the past? Well, when we go back in past, when was it last about an average of 15 degrees Celsius? Well, we have to go back about 130,000 years. In 130,000 years, we can see a nice little peak there. And by the way, humans have, Homo sapiens by, by our fossil record have only been on our planet for about 300,000 years, which would put us almost in an ice age when we first evolved, which is a really interesting idea as to why we might not be coping with climate change very well. But we have to go back to about 130,000 years. Well, what was the world like 130,000 years ago when the, when the temperature was about it was today? Well, it was a vast difference. Sea levels were 20 to 30 feet higher than they are today. 20 to 30 feet high. What would Louisiana look like with a 20 or 30 foot increase in sea level? What would Florida look like? And what about the CO2 levels? What was the CO2 levels? When, when was it last 410 parts per million of carbon dioxide? Well, we actually have to go off this graph. This graph only goes back about a million years. We have to go back 3 million years to when the CO2 levels were the equivalent of where we are today. And what was the world like back 3 million years ago? Sea levels were 80 to 120 feet higher. The average temperature was three or four degrees higher than it is today. So we're talking like 18 to 19 degrees Celsius on average. An incredibly different world. There was no ice caps in the polar regions. Tro uh, forests were, were on the Arctic uh, edge of the Arctic Ocean. It was an absolutely a different world. So what's going on? How can we have the same temperature and CO2 readings of these past climates and yet have a very different world? Well, we're starting to find the answer in a lot of different scientists who are measuring what's happening in our oceans. And, in, and you have to do one thing over this Earth Week. I want you to really contemplate the amazing thing that these oceans are doing for us. Because right now, it looks as if they are helping to buffer and mitigate the craziness that we're doing to our atmosphere. They are absorbing 90% of all the extra heat that we are trapping by our greenhouse gases. And they are also absorbing a lot of that CO2. And, and what do they do with that? What do they do with that heat and that CO2 readings? Well, I want you to introduce you to one of the most amazing models. When I first saw it, I was just awestruck by it. It's called the thermohaline circulation, also known as the conveyor belt system or the meridional uh, overturning system. And it's basically the way that the surface waters of our oceans can sequester temperature, hold the temperature, hold CO2, and even oxygen, which is produced by photosynthesis at, at the surface, and they can store it in the deep sea. And it, it is an amazing uh, connection between surface and deep sea waters. So most, most of the planet gets hit uh, by solar energy at the uh, polar, or sorry, at the equator. That heat then gets transferred via these ocean currents to the polar regions where the water cools and sinks, taking that CO2 down into the uh, ocean depths, taking vital oxygen down to deep sea ecosystems, dispersing the heat evenly across our planet. Well, you could imagine what happens if we start warming our polar regions so that the discrepancy between the temperature changes of polar regions and equator isn't that great? Well, this cooling that occurs at our polar regions won't happen anymore. We're not gonna get this sinking rate that then sends vital oxygen and stored CO2 to the deep. So whereas we saw with Charles Keeling's breathing of the planet, Wally uh, Stoker, Stoker uh, recognized that the, the ocean currents are our circulatory system of our planet. They are taking oxygen, vital things, and they're moving it around our planet. And if we stop, if we start mesh, uh, messing with the temperature changes between the polar regions and the deep sea regions, we are going to have this whole thing stop. And just like your body, if your body all of a sudden starts stops circulating to different parts of your regions, those regions are going to die and we will see the deep sea die. And guess what? Scientists are already measuring a slowing down of these ocean currents and this conveyor belt system. 
And that brings us to a huge pause because the last time our ocean currents looked like they stopped in their circulatory pattern, we had the greatest mass extinction that ever occurred on our planet called the Permian extinction, where 90% of marine life went extinct and anywhere from 70 to 80% of terrestrial life went extinct. That is not a good thing. So what does this mean for the future? And how am I doing on time here? So what does this mean for the future? It means that we have some things that are going to happen, things that are gonna be inevitable to happen. Rising sea levels I've already talked about. And by the way, rising sea levels where mo the majority of people on our planet live on the coastal regions, we are gonna have massive climate refugees. I mean, it is going to be unbelievable how many people are gonna be displaced by loss of their homes. Tropical storms are increasing. And this should make sense because where do tropical storms get their energy? From the heat in the oceans. So if we heat up the oceans, the more likely we're gonna get more frequent storms and more intense storms. And sure enough, over the last 40 years, the number of tropical storms that form and the number like class three or above storms that are forming has tripled, tripled. Unbelievable how much um, we are seeing the climate change rear its ugly head precipitation and wildlife are going to change. They talk about here in the Puget Sound, we're gonna get more rain. Well, that might, we might think, okay, we're gonna avoid, you know, a lot of the climate change problems. Well, not really, because what that means is that as our winters get warmer, we're not gonna have the snowpack in the mountains because it's gonna be raining the whole time. And that snowpack is the vital sources that feed our streams and our lakes during the drought seasons of our summer. So we're gonna be in trouble. Um, agriculture is shifting and plant life is uh, shifting. In fact, uh, uh, getting back to wildlife real quick, uh, wildlife isn't able to keep up with the, with the changes that are occurring uh, as far as our ecosystem changes have occurred. And the only ones that will are gonna be those wonderful generalists like the rats and the cockroaches that are gonna survive. So we're really creating uh, an interesting biome. Um, some areas in agriculture might actually get extended growing seasons, but you know what, that has a, a downfall as well. Uh, insects love our, our crop fields. So if we start growing extending seasons in some areas, that means that insects are going to also repopulate and get larger. Nature loves to balance out and uh, we have to always be wary of that. And it's gonna affect you directly. It's already affecting you. Try and buy fire insurance in some areas of California today. Try and buy flood insurance in some areas. Our taxes are going up because we have to fork out billions of dollars every year for, for mitigating against climate change. Health, we are polluting, we are putting more and more pollutions into our air with our burning of fossil fuels. Ozone levels at the surface of the earth are, are increasing. That leads to greater respiratory problems such as asthma and asthma is on the rise. And we all, we, we all know how disease transmission can uh, affect our society. Uh, we've all seen that with coronavirus and I'm not suggesting that climate change is gonna increase coronavirus infection. But when we think about, let's say we get more warmer weather around here, that means there's gonna be more mosquitoes year round. And those mosquitoes are great at transmitting, being vectors for transmitting diseases like malaria. There's no doubt that malaria will come back. So I'm gonna finish though, because I think there is optimism. There is a case for optimism. And that case for optimism, we have town hall conferences like we do now, which uh, is showing us that we care. We want change. We want to see something happen. We're tired of the business as usual model. There's huge momentum. People are being educated earlier on climate change. There's a huge momentum of people who want to see their changes and they're voting. They're voting with their conscience. They're saying, I'm not gonna vote for that person because they don't believe in climate change. Renewable technologies are becoming cheaper, more available. And it's a race to figure out who can develop the next uh, major breakthrough. World policies, hey, our president Joe Biden has just announced that we are going to cut emissions by 50% in 2030 compared to the 2005 levels. And he does, he says he does that because it's a moral obligation, poppycock. He's doing that because all the other world countries are doing the same thing because it's an economic incentive. There is gonna be huge financial gain for those who can develop policies faster. And I can guarantee you that they want, everybody wants to have the monopoly on that great renewable technology so they can sell it to other uh, groups. And then finally, and this is why I've, I'm so honored to be the moderator for the youth voices this afternoon, because the youth are speaking out. They are taking control of our, of our uh, 
dialogue. And if you haven't seen Greta Thunberg's uh, United Nations climate uh, address, it is powerful and it is eloquent and it is truth, it's right on. And it is something that we see these young people saying, we're tired of this, we need change. And that's why it is going to be a wonderful future. So I'm gonna end it there. I think I might've gone over time, I apologize. And Tracy, do you want to? Uh... No, no, that was um, uh, awesome. Thank you very much. All right, so um, you know, uh, my friend Heather reminds me that uh, we we reached uh, 420 parts per million CO2 average atmosphere uh, on April 20th this year. So only a couple of days ago. So what a way to celebrate Earth Day, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, I've never done this before, and uh, perhaps basically with some of the other co-hosts can help me out here. But uh, um, I want to take a question or two from the audience for the, our speakers. So um, if you want to um, ask a question, if you could write the word "stack" in the chat, and that way. We, I, I can call on you and we can kind of do this in some sort of organized fashion. Normally I'd have you come up to the microphone, right? But that just isn't gonna work today. So does anybody have any uh, questions for our speakers? Mute. Oh man. Oh, you're... Hello? Okay, there you go. Okay, go ahead, great. please. Go ahead. Um, I just want to thank uh, Professor Sanders for um, uh, Saunders for his great uh, conversation and sharing with us, and you know, letting us know what our present situation is, plus uh, what our future is is what we're looking at. And I just want to know, you know, as far as the what what we can we do to really help? I mean, what are things that, we're already doing things already, but what can we really do to help? create a change, a greater change? Well, I, I think one of the things um, is one of the most important things to do um, is, is, to, is to really vote, to get out and vote and, and to choose the leaders that are going to make the, 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 the smart decisions. And not just that, but hold them to it. You know, Biden making that announcement is great, but we have to hold him to it now. Now we have to make sure that he follows through. That is probably the number one thing that we all can do because this is uh, not just... Uh, our immediate future, it's the future for our kids. And uh, I feel very passionately about that. Okay. Grow your own food, by the way, grow your own food. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, um I have a hand up from Vivian, and I, unfortunately, there's too many people for me to kind of scroll through all the names. But Vivian, if you still have your question, feel free, feel free to ask. No. Nope. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Oh, I, I'm sorry. Okay, um, I had my, I, I, I had to unmute myself. I just realized I was talking muted. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Go ahead, please. <laughs> sorry. Um, it, mine's kind of a double fold because uh, a lot of times we have our uh, tree canopies cut, and then. Uh, such as with light rail, our light rail system in 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 shoreline, and and uh, and then we're told that our trees are going to be replaced. Well, a lot of times they're replaced with these small trees that will never get big, um, and which will produce uh, less oxygen and absorb less carbon. And then we also have um, a problem with. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, all these corporations who are claiming net, uh, car uh, zero carbon uh, as they offset and, you know, and how do we uh, stop all the offsetting, you know, and, and get our politicians to get on board uh, to hold these people's feet to the fire and, and, and with the stopping the offsetting and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and actually set a price on carbon that uh, will make corporations want to change their bad behavior. <laughs> That's my question. It's kind of, I'm sorry if it's too long. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll address the last part. I mean, I, there's, there's, yeah, that was a, that was a, a, a loaded kind of question, but I'll, I'll try and address. So this is why I, I think voting is very important because when you think about what that vote means, it means that we can start changing our policies instead of subsidizing fossil fuels. Let's start subsidize, subsidizing uh, renewable energies. Let's start subsidizing things that actually help the climate. Uh, so those are big, big issues that uh, that I think can uh, can really have some leverage when we start uh, using our vote very, very wisely. And uh, Vicky, did you want to comment on that? Uh, tr thank you, Tracy. Uh, no, I I uh, did not have a comment. Okay. I think Sally had a. Her hand raised. Okay. Well, actually, uh, we're going to have to move on because we want to keep on schedule. So Sally and uh, Mr. Casover, I, I apologize for having to cut you off, but uh, we will make basically the contact information for both of our speakers available. So if you have individual questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer it through that means. All right, so <laughs> um, I guess basically now is your turn. All right, so uh, this is your turn to choose your own adventure if you remember that series of books. Um, we're gonna have a Zoom breakout rooms for various topics. Uh, so for instance, in breakout room one, we will have Stephen La 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 Loff, I do apologize if I mispronounced your name. Uh, the past president of the Seattle Electrical Vehicle Association, the SEVA, will tell us about electric vehicles, both bikes and cars. In breakout room two, we're going to have Natalie Calkins, who is from the recycle, who is the recycling coordinator for the Lake Forest Park Garbage and Recycling Utility Republic Services, and they also service a lot of other municipalities as well. And she'll talk about co composting and recycling. And uh, um, to get to these breakout rooms, uh, you have a button down in your um, uh, toolbar down at the bottom there. And if you click on it, you'll see basically that uh, your name is under unassigned at the moment. And uh, the idea is that uh, um, if you look under the 11 o'clock hour, then you'll see that there are two choices, the electric vehicles, bikes and cars, and the composting and recycling. So at this point, I encourage you to join one of these breakout rooms. And if the uh, um, presenters in both of those rooms will wait a few minutes for everybody to show up. So say, let's start at about 11.05, uh, then basically I will have opportunities for everybody to get there. Now, if you mess up somehow, or if uh, you know you don't know how to do this, that's totally cool. Um, I'll be around uh, as well, basically Amy and a couple of the other uh, third place common staff to help you basically to find your room and uh, um, and and then basically uh, be able to participate. Now, the point is then after um, uh, when we get we get close to about eleven thirty or so, uh, you'll see an announcement that says the breakout room will close in about five minutes. Um, that's your cue, uh, speakers to or presenters to basically uh, make sure you. Can wrap it up and get com last comments from your group. And then we'll basically do the same thing at 11.30. So I'll see you back here at about 11.30.